All right, so it's uh, 10 o'clock and uh, we are about to start this webinar. Uh, a warm welcome to all of you uh, who is here and listening in to this webinar about LCA Climate and Buildings. Uh, I will start with going through our webinar guidelines and give a short introduction about Swedish Life Cycle Center before we hit today's topic. And uh, I sent out a program to all of you in beforehand, uh, but we will take a quick look at that in just a second. Uh, I would just like to check if you all can hear me and if you can, uh, please raise your hands. Mm, a lot of raised hands, perfect. <laughs> Seems to be working all right. Um, yes, we will move on because we have a lot of uh, interesting presentations to listen to today. Uh, so here's the program. I will start with the introduction uh, and we will listen to Christina Einarsson talking about uh, introducing the working group and uh, the dialogue forum and network. Uh, we will listen to Matti Kuikinen about state of the art, art uh, from the Nordic, Nordic Building Authorities. Then we will listen to two presentations. Uh, the first one uh, from Harpa Birgistotte uh, and the second one from Marianne Wik about reference values for climate and buildings. Uh, then we will listen to Jeanette Svede Lundi uh, uh, about Skanska's use of LCA in climate calculations as a tool and uh, what she sees as potential in harmonizations from an industry point of view. Then we'll have a short summary and the way forward and also talk about the Nordic Climate Forum that will happen in August. It was sent out a preliminary program uh, with the invitation to the webinar. And then there is time for, uh, for discussion and questions. And the webinar guidelines. If you do not see the presentations, uh, they can be found at our website. Uh, you can see the ad address and if you can't see it, it's lifecyclecenter.se uh, and then you go to calendar. We will start with our presenta presentations. So please save your questions to the end and that is because we are recording the webinar and want to uh, publish it on our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, and you are as default muted during the presentation. And when it's time for questions, I will be able to unmute you to ask your questions. And you will get the presentation sent out, uh, sent out afterwards, all of you who has uh, registered for the webinar. Short about Swedish Life Cycle Center. Uh, we are a collaboration platform for academia, industry and research institute as well as government agencies. And we're aiming for credible and applied life cycle thinking globally. Uh, we're a partner driven center uh, that started 1996. Uh, at the moment we have 14 partners and eight government agencies in collaborations. And uh, our network involves over 400 life cycle professionals, but there is always room for more organizations. So if you're interested in what it means and what benefits there are in uh, being a partner, please uh, contact us. And um, we are in one of these dots now because these are our ways of work. Uh, we're in the seminars and webinar part and um, since we're co-organizing this with the working group, uh, that is uh, one of our, um, <laughs> another important part of our ways of work, uh, being an arena for uh, exchange of knowledge between life cycle professionals. Uh, but there's more, and I encourage you to visit our website to see more about other ongoing working groups, uh, read more about our two-day course for applied life cycle thinking, and uh, other seminars and, uh, and uh, in research projects that we are a part of. So that's uh, the quick introduction to us. Um, the website is one part. There's a lot of good information there, uh, but you can also follow us in, the, so in our social media channels or sign up for our newsletter so that we can stay in touch after this webinar. 
Uh, and with that said, uh, I will actually leave the floor to Christina uh, to talk, give a presentation about the working group and the network. Thank you, Maria. Uh, I will share my screen. I hope this works. Can you see my presentation now? Yes. Good. Uh, yes, my name is Kristina Einarsson and I work at the Swedish National Board of Housing Building and Planning. And I have been chair for this group since the startup uh, in uh, last year in the autumn. Uh, and I will give an introduction to this working group and this network, this Nordic working group for LCA climate and buildings. Uh, some background why we started this network is uh, there's a declaration from the Nordic Council of Ministers from May law 2018 and I will come uh, shortly back to that to what was uh, said in this declaration but that was the background to start up this uh, the initiative to from Finland and Sweden uh, authorities uh, to start up uh, this uh, Nordic Climate Forum for Construction that we had in October uh, last year in Malmö. I think a lot of you who participate on this meeting were there. And the main target for the conference was to start up the work for Nordic harmonization on regulations and climate emissions from buildings and from a life cycle perspective. Uh, after the meeting in Malmö in October, same month, uh, there came a new declaration from the Nordic Council of Ministers and I will just shortly take up some notes from, from the declaration. Uh, the declaration from May uh, 2018 uh, pointed out that the Nordic region would be the mo world's most integrated region, which also concerns the cons uh, construction market. Uh, and the ambition is to have a, a com common goal of promoting low carbon emissions in the construction uh, as part of a common climate policy. Uh, also to, to work for cooperation on harmonization on building regulation between the authorities in the Nordic countries. And they also want to explore the possibilities of co-financing these efforts. So I really want to highlight this last point. It's important to, to, to have a financing for, for work for this. And here below you see the link where you can read the full declaration if you're interested in that. And the declaration from October last year, uh, the, the name of the declaration is a Nordic Declaration on Low Carbon Construction and Circular Principles in the Construction Sector. Uh, and the ministers pointed out that the Nordic countries can benefit from sharing best practices. Uh, they also want us to collaborate in the search for low carbon solutions. They also want to see a, a harmonization of relevant approaches it comes to methods, data, tools and policies. And in this work it's important to also include stakeholders in the construction and real estate sectors uh, and also from related industries and also from academia and research institutes. And the, the hope is that we will show on a glo global uh, leadership uh, so that the Nordic uh, region can become a forerunner in, in, uh, when it comes to development of low carbon construction solutions. So this is the background why we have started up this work. And here you find the, the link for, for where you can read the full declaration. So we have a, a strong backup from, from uh, the ministers in the Nordic countries in, in this work. So the organization for this work, uh, we have procured Swedish Life Cycle Center who will organize and facilitate this network. And that consists of a working group, it's a smaller group and a dialogue forum, which is a wider group of stakeholders and it's open for everyone. So you can please share this information if you think others would be interested to, to, um, of this group network. The working group is a forum for experts with a focus on LCA and policy making. And we have uh, the, the participants are from the authorities, the Nordic authorities from academia and industry. And, and we hope to exchange experiences and raise knowledge gaps, uh, etc. Uh, and hope to facilitate this Nordic collabor collaboration in, in this task. So what have we achieved so far? Uh, we have been working with a, a program for the working group. So it will be clear what is the ambition with this work. Uh, and hopefully it will be, it is a bit clearer now. And this is a living document uh, that we probably will update on a yearly basis. 
we have also had discussion on uh, proposal on key areas for harmonization. This was done on the last web meeting. We have had uh, three web meetings so far. And uh, we were discussing uh, the decarbonization efforts, assessment methods and data and its flows. And I will come back to some small uh, notes from uh, the results from the discussions. Uh, we have also started to collaborate on a Nordic database. Uh, this is mainly driven by Sweden and Finland since we both are, are developing uh, uh, databases. Uh, and uh, so far it's Thomas Johansson, <clears throat> who is also at the same authority as me, and Martin Erlansson from the Swedish Environmental Research Institute from Sweden. Uh, who have been cooperating uh, with Matti Kuitinen at the Ministry of Inver Environment uh, together with uh, Tarja Hekkinen at VTT, uh, Technical Research Institute Center in Finland and Janne Pesu at the Finnish Environment and Institute. So we start up this work and, and uh, we'll see what, how, how far we get uh, when this will be launched in, in last year, next year in, in January. <clears throat> We have also had discussions on, on the development of assessment methods. Uh, for example, Tove Malmqvist, who had an assignment from Boverket. Uh, uh, she's at the Royal Institute of Technology. Uh, she has uh, given a proposal uh, on a development of a roadmap for a climate declaration in Sweden and uh, limit values. And she has had contact with, uh, to mention some, uh, Harpa Birgistotir in Aalborg University, but also with Matti Kuitinen. So we try to at least uh, start up this work and uh, uh, we hope that we will also move, move in the same direction. So, uh, I just want to highlight some of the things from the program for the working group, uh, the expected impacts that we are hoping for, that uh, the Nordic countries have compatible uh, approaches to building regulation and when it comes to methodology and assessment of uh, climate emissions, and that, that we share best practices on this subject. Uh, but the main target and, and, and the main major uh, impact that we hope for is to, to reduce the building sectors when it comes to climate emissions and that that follows the same rate as national uh, climate goals. And we hope also that the Nordic collaboration have made it easier for the industry to construct low carbon buildings in the Nordic countries. And here you have the link to where you can find the, the whole program. I just want to highlight three of the targets uh, in this um, uh, program. Uh, we want to uh, identify key areas for harmonization and we have started up this work, uh, but of course we need to deepen this. Uh, we hope to initiate the common projects, that's the way that we think that we need to, to deepen this uh, harmonization and we hope this is an arena for exchange of best practices. Uh, now I have some slides uh, from the discussion, the results from the discussion on, on the key areas for harmonization. This was discussed on the working group uh, in, in April. And here are some notes from the decarbonization efforts. Uh, it was lifted up that this is a momentum for taking the embodied carbon into discussion. And the ongoing development of databases is important. And in addition to products, it should also, the construction work should be considered. Uh, there are pilot projects and findings for greenhouse gas limit values for building. This would be relevant to share to, to uh, more, uh, as well as regulatory development and related studies is also valuable for sharing. It was also uh, highlighted that maybe there's too much discussion on harmonization, but not enough action towards it. And hopefully we will get to more action. Uh, we don't need to proceed at the same pace, but helping each other along the way is more relevant. Uh, although we try, we may never reach full harmonization, but still there's an opportunity for a large degree of harmonization. So we'll see how, how far it's possible to reach. But all the Nordic countries have the same direction also regarding the climate goals for construction. So getting there is just a question of time. So these were some of the, the things that was pointed out on, on the discussion on the carbonization's efforts. Uh, two of the groups were discussing uh, assessment methods and uh, here are some of the uh, things that were discussed and highlighted. Uh, it's important that we have the same assessment methods in the Nordic countries. 
so the suggestion to harmonize and cooperate is around the module A4 and A5. Uh, also, the existing buildings are important uh, to reuse them. Uh, we could harmonize the calculation period, same area, and the reference values for buildings. But I think uh, a lot of you were quite skeptical about common limit values, but calculation and boundary should be the same. And maybe we should aim for uh, common goals rather than common limit values. Uh, in this work, we need more transparency so it's possible to compare between countries. And then we have the, the, the third topic that were discussed, data and its flows. And it was highlighted that uh, some background data and calculation rules methods uh, that we have them, it's the same in each country. Uh, if we have one database, it would be easy uh, and a plan for that should be developed. So um, uh, there's a test period going on in different countries and, and we have to be open to changes and adjust and hopefully agree on indicators if you want to succeed on, on harmonization. Uh, background information to qualify the values this is important. Uh, it's important to have similar indicators in the Nordic regions. Uh, the use of perspectives is also important and the reporting format of the data should be the same. Uh, so these are some of the results and of course we need to deepen uh, these uh, uh, if you want to reach some uh, harmonization. But I hope this has given you some kind of uh, an, um, uh, picture on, on uh, what the, we are aiming for in this working group. Uh, and uh, I have been a chair uh, from, uh, from the startup and I will give uh, this task to Matti Kuitini, who will be the chair of the summer and uh, he's been co-chair so far and Anders Trudesen will be co-chair and we hope to share this task uh, to be chair in the Nordic uh, authorities. And please you can spread this uh, information, on this network and I hope that we will um, proceed and, and deepen the, this work. So thank you, Maria. This was my last slide. Thank you, Christina, for a great presentation. Uh, we will move on uh, to our next speaker, uh, Matti Koitinen. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, good morning from Finland. Bumoron, hyvä huomenta. No all the Scandinavian languages that I'm able to speak. Let me just open my presentation here. So uh, I suppose that, uh, are you able to see this? Maria, can you kind of confirm? I see your presentation. Great. So, uh, two disclaimers before I go forward. The first disclaimer is that I had collected the information into this presentation based on the discussions with my Nordic colleagues. And although I tried my best to understand everything correctly, there might be some inaccuracies. So if you have any questions, please ask the, uh, the your local authorities directly. And then secondly, this presentation is rather technical. So we will be going into the details of LCA. So as a disclaimer, it might be a bit boring at some paces. But anyway, I would like to give you a brief introduction or an update about what is going on in the development of LCA methods and, and tools and databases in the Nordic countries. And this is an update to the presentation that I gave in Malmö uh, last autumn. So uh, if we uh, have first a quick overlook of what's happening in different Nordic countries, so first of all, there are national carbon neutrality goals. As you can see here, all of us are going towards carbon neutrality at a certain time frame. So Norway is leading the way uh, by year 2030, then Finland 35 and Iceland and Sweden year 40 and, and Denmark has very significant reduction goals as well. So how does this then uh, apply to the building sector? When we talk about uh, the regulation or plant regulation and low carbon construction, we can see that in Sweden and Finland, there are plans uh, in place and Denmark is also on its track towards possibly uh, applying a regulation on year 22, although their scope is a bit wider. They are having this uh, nine indicator uh, sustainability criteria that's currently about to be tested. 
and Norway has talks about and considerations about uh, extending the regulation into this direction as well, but no uh, uh, decisions yet. Then what's going on in each of these countries at the moment? Uh, if we first take a look at Denmark, uh, as I told, uh, there is the voluntary uh, sustainability class pilot uh, starting this year. It's going to be tested for two years. Then Denmark has started uh, together with Finland and France a, a project on defining a so-called carbon handprint, its methods and definitions. And then, of course, uh, the famous LCA book tool is being currently developed further. So it's an ongoing process of taking that for forward. And I have to uh, also mention that Denmark is doing wonderful work on, on research and, and uh, uh, reports of, of LCF buildings. That's very informative for all of us. Then in Finland, we are developing a generic database currently uh, in a tight collaboration with Sweden. And we are co collaborating about the carbon handprint project with uh, Denmark. We are also working with the limit values for buildings. And then we are extending our work with the authorities who are in charge of the in infrastructure work so that our methods and database could work there as well. Iceland is about to start a roadmap to sustainable construction industry uh, by year 2030. So it's, it's a, the project will start this year and it's, it's uh, going to set um, also the climate uh, in, into focus. And Iceland has also declared their interest in a joint Nordic generic database. As for Norway, uh, the climate declaration, as I mentioned, is being considered at the moment, but no exact uh, uh, plans or, or dates uh, are there uh, for, for setting this into regulations. And then in Sweden, uh, there are plans for, uh, or actually there are drafts uh, uh, for both law and decree on the climate declaration of buildings. The development of generic database is going on. Also the limit values for buildings are being studied at the moment or in, in near future. Uh, if we put these on a timeline and we see how the, the methods and databases are about to evolve in different countries, you can see here the blue lines indicating the development of methods and the green lines indicating the development of databases. So you can see that there is a sort of nice temporal overlap of activities which indicates that there is good, good potential for collaboration. And due to timings, I have to move on rather quickly, but you can have these uh, after the presentation so you can have a closer look at, at the slides. And then uh, as an update of last autumn's summary about LCA stages that are considered in different countries, here we are, uh, I'm showing them in, in a table format and using the acronyms familiar from Ian Standards about LCA of buildings. And uh, there is not that much change in the scope uh, during, uh, regarding the life cycle stages. We can conclude that most of us are taking the whole A module into account, production and construction stages. And then there are some differences about the use stage and end of life stage. And this of course uh, is good information if we would like to proceed forward with the harmonization of LCA methods for buildings. Then uh, looking at the included building types in different Nordic countries, and by the way, the last line also here shows how the e European Commission's levels framework is, is working. So we can see that in the Nordic countries, most residential office, retail, schools, uh, health buildings, hotels and sports facilities are included, but then there are differences uh, whether or not single family homes or summer cottages or renovation projects or industrial buildings are, are included. But there is the common core can be identified. Also looking at the, all the possible environmental indicators, it's pretty clear that greenhouse gas emissions or carbon footprint uh, is, is included in all of these definitions. But the Denmark is following a much wider uh, scope uh, close to levels approach. Then if we look at the building parts that are included uh, in different countries assessment methods, here in the top uh, we have the different parts of the building substructure, then the main structure, building services, finishes and external things. Uh, we can see that everybody is taking into account a substructure and structure, but then there is difference when we move on towards building service systems and, and finishes of the buildings. 
and uh, mm -hmm. but we can conclude that the structural components are are there in all of these in most of the assessment methods that are currently in use then uh, if we talk about the development of generic product data, how does that look in different countries? I made uh, a survey or uh, asked my colleagues in different Nordic countries. So if we look at the Denmark, uh, as most of you know, the German Okobaudat is in use in, in, in Denmark. And in Denmark, the data with the LCA book, uh, 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 the tool and the data LCA book are integrated and that's free for everyone to want to use. And there are also predefined building elements uh, being developed uh, for the for, to ease in the calculation. And Denmark hasn't indicated any plans of making their own national generic database, but they would be interested in collaboration with a uh, common generic database with the Nordics. And of course, the reuse and recycling aspects are important for Denmark as well. Then, as for Finland, uh, the generic database development is going on. The first version should be able uh, should be out there. Uh, on New Year's Day or something like that next year. Uh, we are also working on predefined building element values. And then uh, we are extending our discussions towards the infrastructure works and infrastructure products so that we would have a joint data set with them. Uh, in Finland, we have very, very limited amounts of EPDs available. Therefore, the generic database is very important. Although we have very good work from the national EPD operator, but despite of their great efforts, the, the number of EPDs is, is still rather small. Then, uh, as for Iceland, uh, there are several foreign databases and data sets in use, such, such as EPD Noria and Environdec. And uh, Iceland has shown interest in a joint Nordic generic database. In Norway, uh, there is uh, uh, no generic database, but one-click LCA-based uh, uh, database is, is used uh, at the moment in, in uh, uh, like public projects. There's heavy emphasis on EPDs, which are widely available in Norway. And also there is uh, interest in, in exploring the possibilities of Nordic collaboration in, in the further on in the future. Then uh, last but not least, Sweden. Uh, there is an, a tool by IVL Institute which is free to use and that uses generic database. Also, uh, the National Road Administration has a, an open database which is uh, maybe perhaps a bit limited on its scope. But there is a governmental assignment to include a database and uh, it should be completed by latest by year 22. However, there is a current development of, uh, of joint database, uh, generic database that should be completed by the end of this year. And therefore, Finland and Sweden, because we have the same schedule, we are tightening our collaboration and seeing we, if we could possibly do some things uh, together or in, in collabora collaboration by supporting each other. Then, finally, to conclude, I can say that uh, it seems that in a year the harmonization has taken great steps forward, but still, uh, it seems that the methodological side is mostly untouched and there is there is room for more a discussion and more joint development in that side. I don't mean that we should reinvent the wheel. We have good Ian standards, we have the levels proposal, but still there is so much to be defined when we want to go to the level of regulating something. Regulation and the standard are two rather different animals. Then a comparison of the industry's own roadmaps between Nordic countries could be rather valuable. Sweden and Finland have completed them, to, at least up, up to my understanding. There are some initiatives uh, in, in Iceland and perhaps uh, Denmark and Norway have already, also been working on this. So, so I think that we could compare these. And uh, last uh, but uh, not least, I would like to mention that there is, a, a, from my perspective, a very good Nordic uh, spirit of collaboration going on. So I'm, I'm thankful for all of you who are uh, taking part in this collaboration and joint discussions. I've been, I think it's been great. And this is something that we really should cherish and, and take forward and, and continue also during the next year. This might be our uh, key to success. So, then this was my presentation and here you can see the Nordic contact persons if you have any further questions for your respective countries. Thank you very much.
Oh, thank you, Matti, uh, for that great overview of what is uh, going on in, uh, in different Nordic countries. Uh, we will move on with our next speaker, uh, Harpa. Uh, the floor is yours, and I will share your presentations from my computer. So, <laughs> you will see how the connection between me and you will yeah. go on now. <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> yeah. So um, I am going to present for you the results of a report that was recently published just here in March on um, uh, the climate impacts from 60 buildings. And um, in, in the next slide, you will uh, be just, uh, the purpose of the study was to establish sufficient uh, data background on the climate impacts of buildings in Denmark over the life cycle. On, and on basis of this, to look into could the possible reference values or limit values be suggested. So you can see on the next slide, uh, the data background uh, for this 60 buildings is that we have mostly been focusing on residential buildings and offices. Um, and you can see the distribution of the building cases that we have had here. And we had yeah some few other buildings involved in our case. Um, on the next slide, you can see that, um, well, we, the method was to calculate all uh, building cases in the LCA book tool in the same version and, and with the same methods applied. So many of the cases that we got was from the DGNB certification in Denmark. So there, most of the cases there were, uh, uh, early, you know, have been, uh, calculated in an Excel sheet uh, that we have also developed earlier for the DGNP um, system in Denmark to be used, but also several cases we collected ourselves, for example, for the single family houses that not yet have been uh, certified uh, in Denmark. So that is, for example, an example of cases where we were collecting data ourselves. On the next slide, you see um, uh, uh, just an overview from the single family houses, how we have been displaying for the reader of the report, um, uh, you know, the information about the different material types that have been involved and included in the building cases that we have been working with. And we were trying to, uh, in the report to, for example, for the single family houses where we didn't have any cases to collect them cases with a you know what we were expecting to see some kind of a the variation that we could expect to have in the climate impacts of those building types uh, on the next slide you just see the phases that we have been including in this calculation so um, uh, and they are highlighted with green uh, and i am not going to count them up all now because you know them but we uh, as Matti was showing earlier, is that we are now suggesting to in the future to also work with A4 and A5, but in this project they were not included. Uh, we were calculating for a reference study period of both 50 and 80 years in this report, because this has been some kind of tradition in Denmark to work with longer um, uh, reference study period. But uh, well, we are talking about harmonization now. We uh, yeah, so that was we have been working both with fifty and eighty years. But I think our recommenda our recommendations are to work uh, with the fifty years uh, uh, in the future for uh, for this purpose. On the next slide, you see the results. So just for the all of the sixty building cases, and you can see here when we calculate over fifty years. Uh, the results of the operational and the embodied uh, impacts. And uh, the green ones are the uh, embodied uh, impacts uh, and the orange one are the operational impacts. And this is according to our calculation method that I cannot really explain deeply right now here um, now, but you, as you uh, probably many of you know is that for the operational energy we calculate um, uh, forecasting of the future energy supply system in our calculations and we are basing our data for energy on the Danish energy uh, system. 
But what we can see here is that uh, the embodied impacts of the building materials, they uh, have um, a big influence uh, and are important in the building life cycle. On the next slide, um, it's probably a little bit more uh, confusing to see, but this is just display, uh, sh showing the, displaying the, um, what do you say, the carbon, uh, 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 the carbon emissions in a storyline here for us. So we can see uh, on the x-axis, these are the years, up to 50 years, and the lines, this is for all the 60 cases in one line. So I know it's complicated, but it's just to show the when in our timeline uh, the emissions are to, um, uh, will uh, take place. Uh, but since we are taking the carbon sequestration also into account and so on, then of course we should always compare by the end of the life cycle after 50 years. So we'll see here and we can see that uh, the difference of the 50 years is that there is a, a large difference in the embodied impacts of um, the materials with the lowest of about 150 kilograms CO2 per square meter and sorry it should not see per year it's 150 kilograms per square meter and the highest is 550. Uh, on the next slide you can see and i hope it's uh, uh, you can follow if you can go on the next slide maria uh, we can see the different building types um, and this is in danish i hope it is okay but you can still see the variations between uh, um, uh, the the green one showing again the embodied uh, impacts from the materials and the other one from the operation what we can see here, okay, is that within each building type, there is a large variation of the, for example, the embodied impacts. But we, when we look uh, like horizontally, we can see that the median value, so the median or mean values uh, between the different building types are quite similar uh, for the material use here. So that is, I think, quite important or uh, important to see from our results. Um, and on the next slide, there's just one example to see for the single family house. Again, this, uh, I'm sorry, it's not the same colors now, but the blue one is again the materials and the red one is the operational. You can see how it is. Uh, the mean value is then about seven, uh, the median value is about seven, and then we can see the distribution from the lowest one about uh, on 3.7 or what I can see, and, and, the, and the highest one on the materials about uh, nine or a little bit more than that. And on the right hand side, you can see this carbon journey on a time scale that I think is really important for us to, in a way, have in mind. Uh, about the emissions uh, and on the next and the last slide <laughs> uh, you can see the results uh, of how we have been calculating the reference values and giving some suggestions about how they can be calculated and here we are suggesting uh, so reference values of the total life cycle where we have both uh, uh, the embodied and the uh, impacts and from the operational uh, sum together and that is because you know as you know that the, the, we are calculating the embodied impacts of for example uh, PVs uh, the solar cells and solar panels and so on so they are taking into account so we also um, uh, think and that we need to also then take the benefits of those into account. So that is why we are suggesting reference values um, with um, the total environmental impact from the building. And what you can see here in the lines are the median value, uh, blue in the middle, and then we have uh, uh, the, the lower and the higher quartile. So the green one is showing uh, the value where 25% of the best buildings would be uh, able to meet. And this is a tool where you can see, okay, that's so here we can use this in order, if you want to have uh, limit values later on uh, in the process, you can use those um, data to look into that and, and also to choose your ambition level and it 
you know, to see, okay, how ambition are we going to be in when we are using uh, limit values. So I think this was a brief introduction to the results of our new report. Yes, thank you, Harpa. And I see that uh, Marianne is already uh, sharing, so uh, please. have um, sent in over 130 different uh, buildings. Sorry, is there a problem with my microphone? Because I see that it keeps coming up as muted by the host. Yeah, I, I couldn't hear your start, but maybe everyone else did. I don't know, <laughs> but now okay. I can hear you just fine. <laughs> I'll continue. Yes. Yes, so as mentioned, um, We've had um, over 130 different buildings from around Norway that's been uh, sent in. Um, the LCA reports um, over, um, yeah, from 36 schools, 25 offices, a library and four museums, 15 nurseries, 33 houses of different typologies from a single family house to um, housing blocks and also a hotel six care homes, two swimming pools, a sports hall, and also a neighbourhood. And out from those cases, 14 of them were refurbishment projects. And together, um, this uh, database of buildings covers over a million metres squared of heated floor area and 49,000 uh, building users. And we see that the majority of the uh, case studies are from around the Oslo Fjord, but we also have um, cases from the major cities in Norway, such as Trondheim, Bergen, Stavanger, and also up in the north in uh, Tromsø as well. Um, but we noticed that there were some limitations and uncertainties when we have so many different LCA practitioners uh, reporting in different case studies. First of all, um, as you saw, there's a whole range of different building typologies and sizes. And for each um, LCA report, they have uh, reported the results for the reference design as built and in use phases. Um, not everyone has uh, reported the entire life cycle and it's usually a selection of these from A1 to C4 and D. Um, in Norway um, we have a Norwegian standard for the classification of building parts where each part of the building is labelled from 21 to 79 and again we see that the majority of cases report the building envelope which would be 21 to 29 and then a few cases have also included other building parts like the uh, heating, uh, ventilation services, um, sanitation and so on. Um, all of these standards have followed um, the ISO and EM standards 1404 and 5978 and those that have published since 2018 when the Norwegian standard for uh, greenhouse gas calculations for buildings came, NS3720, uh, those after 2018 follow that. So the whole database spans about uh, 10 years of uh, data from 2009 to 2019. And we also see that a wide range of different tools have been used. For the older studies, they have used the klimagasreinskap.no tool. Um, some have used a ZEB tool, which was uh, developed in the previous uh, research centre for zero emission buildings. Um, and then the new ones are using one click LCA, and that seems to be becoming the industry standard, at least within Norway. 
Um, all of the studies uh, use EPDs as their main data source and then fill in data holes with either EcoInvent or Gobi or another generic database. And we also see that um, there are different uh, construction choices made. So we have a whole range of different uh, construction methods, uh, wood or timber construction, if it's a concrete and steel construction, and that also will influence the results, which design choices they make. However, despite all of these differences, the functional unit is harmonized to one meter squared of heated floor area per year, with a 60 year building lifetime for all of the studies. Um, so the graph you see now shows the greenhouse gas emissions uh, results per life cycle module for the entire database. Um, the percentage that each of the life cycle modules from A1 to C4 uh, contribute. Um, so we've roughly grouped them between materials, energy and mobility. Materials being the green colour at the bottom there. Um, we see that um, with more net um, or nearly zero energy buildings, the in there is a larger increase in emissions from material use and that is because there's more high carbon materials being used in, for example, technical systems which have more frequent replacements. Um, we also see that for the energy part, um, there's actually an increase in the uh, proportion of emissions from energy between the as-built and in-use phase, so it shows the importance of users um, in buildings and their habits. Um, and another important finding from this um, research is that the largest influence we have for emission reduction is in the design phase where those important decisions are taking place. Um, within our study, we have primarily focused on materials, and so that's limited to A1 to A3 and B4. Um, so here we have the results for all of the buildings in the as-built phase. And we see there's quite a bit of variation between the different buildings. So if you see the third uh, column along, um, it's a building from 2010. And we know that with this case, um, they did not optimize the um, greenhouse gas emissions or material choices at all. And there was an awful lot of exposed concrete used in the building, which has led to higher embodied emissions. Whilst, for example, the next highest uh, column in 2014, um, part of it is blue and the other part is orange. And that orange part is the replacements during the 60 year lifetime. And um, we noticed that this building had a much more detailed material inventory, including the technical equipment, which is why it's experiencing higher results. So if we go uh, think back to um, the disclosure of building parts, we see it's important that uh, we actually include the entire building with all the technical equipment as well to get a full profile view of the building's emissions. Um, and then the pink um, projects within the graph are refurbishment projects. And we see there that they have uh, significantly lower emissions compared to the other buildings. And that's because large parts of the building are being used and typically um, parts of the building that often include quite high embodied or high carbon uh, materials such as concrete and steel in the foundations and uh, uh, structure. Um, so another aspect um, what we've seen is that it is important with a whole life cycle perspective. So this study we have um, done um, provides reference values for uh, life cycle modules A1 to A3 and B4 and the current um, Norwegian building code uh, tech uh, provides requirements for life cycle module B6 energy drift, which we can then energy use in operation which we can use um, to um, reduce the amount of energy towards um, nearly zero energy building. Um, and we have also had um, some projects and especially momentum within the Oslo area for emission free construction sites and if any of you are interested in that, then you can click on the link below to read a bit more about it. Um, but then we see that within Norway, within work needs to be done on the remaining uh, life cycle modules so that we also have reference values for the rest of those as well. Um, so here we have some of the results. Um, and on the first graph to the left, 
um, we have the results for all of the buildings within the database for the reference design and as built phases. So we see that uh, when they're using the reference building in, for example, one click LC, the emissions are slightly higher than the design and as built phases. Um, going from 6.5 down to 5.5 or 5.4 in average uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalent per meter square per year. Um, so it shows that the, it is possible to make improvements during that design process. Um, but then we see there's not as much improvement between the design and as-built phase, which we should hope that this is because of uh, good planning that they have actually built uh, what they said they were going to build. Um, on the right, we can see the results for various building types. So we have uh, residential buildings in orange, uh, office buildings in grey, uh, school buildings yellow, and nurseries in green. And what was surprising with the results here is that there isn't um, that much variation between the different building typologies. And um, that it doesn't give grounds for actually creating uh, reference values uh, for specific building typologies that actually it's enough to use the reference values for all building types, um, except uh, refurbishment projects, which is that last one in orange, which is where we see there's a significant reduction in emissions when you refurbish instead of um, demolishing and building new. Um, so as a part of the report, we've also come with some um, suggestions for how these greenhouse gas emission uh, reference values for materials can be used in Norwegian buildings. Um, and by using this uh, graph that shows the um, average emissions for all the buildings in the database, we can ascertain a starting point in 2020 for what um, today's Norwegian buildings um, emit. Um, but when we take into account Norway's NDC goals in the emissions gap report, then we see that by 2030 we need to be aiming for a 50 to 55 percent reduction, and by 2050 an 80 to 95 percent reduction. Um, so this graph can be used um, by the authorities or by planners to make sure that their buildings are built in line with national uh, goals for emission reductions. Um, and to do that, we see there's several steps that are needed um, to be able to achieve this. Um, and that involves requiring EPD documentation for all building materials um, that are used within the building. We see in Norway that um, we have quite a lot of EPDs already for the main building envelope, but we're missing those EPDs for the technical systems, which could go some way for explaining why this isn't documented in the life cycle assessments. Um, it was um, also be useful to require greenhouse gas emission calculations for all buildings according to NS3720 um, and there they have two levels. The first one is basic which includes building envelope and solar cells on the roof and NS3720 um, advanced which includes all building parts including all those technical systems and this should be done for the whole life cycle so that we can also develop uh, reference values for um, the whole life cycle, not just for materials. Um, so when um, actors have um, completed their calculations, they can then report these results into a public database so that we can build up that national database and empirical data so that, as I mentioned, we can use it to develop reference values for each life cycle module. Um, and then when we've reached that point, so we'll be in a position to introduce requirements for maximum allowed greenhouse gas emissions for buildings based on these reference values. And as the figure before showed, actually tighten the greenhouse gas emission requirements annually to reach national um, agreements on the Paris uh, Agreement goals. Um, in addition, um, our study has um, shown common measures which are used across the different buildings for emission reduction strategies and some of these include actually reducing the building's footprint and therefore the need for materials in the building. Another option is to consider refurbishment instead of demolishing and building new and to always choose low carbon materials whether that be low carbon concrete, recycled steel and aluminium or plaster um, or choosing wood-based products or prefabricated components. Um, again, um, 
can also require um, materials with EPD documentation. Or if um, designers and architects can choose to build lighter by choosing, for example, hollow core slabs instead of a solid uh, concrete um, slab, um, going for strip foundations instead of, for example, raft foundations where much more concrete is used, or actually integrating building systems, for example, building integrated photovoltaics. Um, also, um, see that it's um, popular to choose local materials to reduce transport emissions and also more robust materials with a longer service life, so we're reducing the amount of times they're being replaced. Um, and also, a lot of the public procurement uh, projects within the Oslo region and other major cities are beginning to require emission free construction sites and asking for electrical. Um, or electric battery construction machinery as well. Um, so if you're interested in reading the report, you can download it from the link below there. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you so much for that for those great presentations. Uh, Harfa and Marianne, I asked you to give some short re uh, reflections uh, by email. I asked you to, uh, if uh, you think that your reference values um, for your respective countries could be of interest from a broader Nordic perspective. Um, what are your reflections about that? Um, I, there has been discussions I can see on the chat about the data and the tools and different results. <laughs> and to keep this short, and of course, we have to be aware of those differences. So before we can, you know, say that uh, Finland, you can just use our <laughs> reference values. But I think we can do a lot of uh, cooperation here, but we can maybe not that easily just from today, both because of the different building types and, and, and yeah, build you know, yeah, and, and also the calculation methods uh, and maybe the methodology that is going to be developed for Finland and the other countries for Norway and Denmark, there are some differences. So we cannot use it directly, but we can uh, use a lot of the knowledge from each other. It shouldn't be that difficult task now when, for example, we have these calculations in Denmark and in Norway and in the other countries getting there. So we could do some kind of a cooperation there. Yes, I agree with you, Hatha, and we're interested in uh, cooperating with the other Nordic countries. Um, personally, I'm not sure if it's possible for a full harmonization, but I think what is important is transparency and actually knowing uh, which assumptions are made uh, between the different Nordic countries when it, term, in, uh, comes to methodologies. For example, uh, with the uh, building lifetime in Denmark versus Norway, um, I think it will be difficult to get all the Nordic countries to agree on a lifetime, but if we at least know which building lifetimes are used, then we can always use conversion factors between the Nordic countries. Thank you for, for that re short reflection and thank you for keeping it short. <laughs> um, we are going to um, continue uh, with the program and uh, our next speaker is uh, Jeanette from Skanska. Uh, I will leave the floor to you. <laughs> Hanette, are you still with us? <laughs> I see your name. <laughs> yes, I was just had to <laughs> unmute myself. Uh, <laughs> classic. <laughs> and now I wonder if you see my screen. Mm, not yet. Not yet. Then I'll do another try. Now it looks uh, like it's working. Now it wor it's working. You shouldn't be able to. Okay. 
Do you see all the participants as well? Uh, I see a, a list of people uh, in one side, but uh, what I see that you are sharing is only your presentation. <laughs> okay. I think okay, it's okay. Okay. But this is, uh, for some reason, it's, it's not changing pictures. Great. Okay, uh, so this is another type of presentation, I think. Uh, Jeanette Svelundin, I come from uh, Skanska, Sweden, and uh, I work uh, in sustainable business and uh, I'm trying to develop uh, issues connected to carbon and climate change. And uh, I think that's why I've been asked to talk here. And uh, for you who don't know Skanska, so uh, this is. Um, still not it doesn't change pictures so no okay i'm sorry it's always some technical problems <laughs> Okay, for you who don't know Skanska, uh, we are a big um, construction company. We are uh, developing our own projects, but we are also uh, uh, developing infrastructure projects. And I represent Skanska Sweden, but we are also, uh, we have business units in Denmark and, uh, and in Norway and a small part in Denmark and Finland and, and UK and US, for example. So, but the main office is in Skanska Sweden and that's where I uh, normally uh, are found. So uh, I think when it comes to climate change and these issues and how, how we have used LCA and uh, carbon uh, calculations, uh, this is really something that Skanska started to work with early on because I think uh, the trends in, in, in I mean, for our business is very clear and it, it's it's a clear to the business leaders i think and it's also clear to all the employees in in our business right now there's a big change i think because uh, a couple of years ago this was something we spoke about sustainability and the sustainability teams you know we were fighting to get into the actual business you know the money making because we need to make money as well. Uh, but right now, I think this is uh, the other way around. They are actually, uh, <laughs> they just want us to be everywhere because they see we can't do business without uh, uh, being really delivering on the green parts and the sustainability parts. And I think that climate and the climate actions are actually very, very st strong driving force. So we see this in um, uh, many, many, uh, uh, requirements from our customers, even the legislation that we spoke about earlier on, but also um, I think uh, this is also, you know, develop of new technologies, new uh, materials. We really have to be competing here. And this is something, um, you know, we just cheer, of course, if you're a sustainability person. So this is our um, this is uh, what we have to deliver on now, I think, every one of us, Skanska and all the others. And this is really good for Skanska, I think, because this has been on the agenda for quite some time. Uh, and uh, um, because uh, the, uh, we started to measuring uh, carbon, quite early, we started to develop a strategic framework for developing uh, how, to, how to measure and communicate how green our projects are. Because if you ask a project how green are you, you have to really be sure what to measure on. And this is something Skanska developed internally, actually, uh, and started to measure on as early as uh, 2009. 
and uh, it's mandatory to actually measure your carbon and to calculate your carbon emissions and that's why we had to come up with some kind of tool and some ca some cost effective way to start calculating carbon because otherwise uh, the projects couldn't fulfill this um, internal uh, strategic framework and th they actually are measured on it so um, th that was really important and I think ever since then when this was launched it, this is the same in all our business units um, it's been a focus on carbon and to be able to ca calculate carbon because it, you really have to be able to calculate things to, to see the effects of, of uh, your measures and stuff uh, so I think this is uh, this was really great for us, and this also led us to to be able to to, um, to decide on goals, uh, because uh, Skanska decided in 2015 to be carbon neutral in 2045, including our whole uh, value chain. Because when we when when um, companies communicate about the sustainability and carbon targets, and you know. It's such a broad value. It means different things depending on how these goals are set. For Skanska, this is this includes the whole value chain. We don't want to move our emissions to China and to buy all our materials from China and just calculate what have we done in Sweden. We, we really want to include everything in, in this uh, goal. And uh, our leader team. Uh, they, I think they were really mature on this stage. They, they re realized that we have to do this to make sense, I think. But to follow up on targets, you always need to calculate. You always need the data and you always need calculations. Because when you set goals, the reduction goals, 50%, 30% compared to what? Um, you can so easily just say a number and and no one really knows what it means because you can't calculate it. So the need of, of calculation, the data, the information is very, very basic here. And for Skanska, that means that we need to be able to calculate our climate impacts in all our businesses, as I said before, in the value chain. And we also have to understand the effects of, of our choices. Uh, as you spoke of earlier on, uh, what what what, uh, what are the right choices when we actually produce something? What materials should we use, exact and and so on? Uh, we have to evaluate our suppliers, our subcontractors, and to do this, we really have to have the information and the data. Otherwise, we have no idea <laughs> what does, uh, are we going in the right direction. And there are many business goals, I think, yeah, and then it goes in Sweden and uh, in Europe and, you know, uh, but we will know how to steer towards these goals. And then we need the figures and the numbers and the calculations. And I always try to also point out that the, the climate issue is not only to reducing the emissions right now, we also have to understand the effects of the climate change. Uh, and that's something we speak a lot about now within the business because there are so many risks. But this is, even if we have this really great targets, we've worked with this for more than 10 years, I think then we also have understood the complexity of this. It's mandatory to calculate carbon emissions for each project A1 to A5 to fulfill our eternal uh, uh, goals. But uh, even said so, this doesn't mean that it's easy done, easily done. I think you've uh, showed some, uh, you know, uh, you have, uh, you're trying to, to set, uh, to, to, to do this uh, different uh, reference levels and so on. And that's good. It is complicated because sometimes we focus on the tools, not on the information that we actually put in the tool, which is very, very important. It doesn't matter what tool you use if you put in completely different if, uh, in data. So for us, uh, we've said that, first of all, we've, uh, we've um, step number one is to, to know, you know, where are the big, in our projects, where do we have the, the hotspots? And then we can start comparing, using, comparing to ourselves, because when you start comparing to other, to, to 
everybody else or someone some some other company then you have all these uh, you know all the, the things that have to be comparable which is very hard to control right now uh, and the comp uh, and then when you're really mature and you understand all this then you can start comparing but then you have to really have to know what you're doing i think and to us this is some kind of scaling because everyone wants to compare even in skanska they want to know am i better than another project or uh, do we actually uh, are we better than our competitors and you know as you've already proven this is kind of hard to say if you don't actually control all the in data uh, so for us to make it work in, in in practice because all all the information that you've gathered in your or studies here it comes from some uh, uh, someone has built this and, and given you the information and this has to be a part of the ordinary process i think it really has to be a part of uh, uh, what we do uh, anyway part of all other information it has to be cost effective otherwise this will not be uh, will never be comparable uh, so when we started doing this we used the cost estimation where we have all the uh, amounts of materials and all the uh, uh, well, uh, working hours for different machines and so on and to, to make this work it has to be digital we can't move around information because there are so much information that you actually need to put in this calculation to make to make it make sense and then we have to have these digital flows that's why i really don't want us to focus on the lca tools yeah i want us to focus on what is the data that we actually need and where do we get the data from in the processes from us uh, the lca tools they can uh, develop they, they will develop i think and the challenges that i see uh, from our perspective is that you know to get this data there is a lot of uh, uh, you have to do uh, changes you have to do things in a new way you might be used to just using your data for cost calculation and now we're using it for carbon as well some other needs you know there are so many things that you have to change um, and that takes time and all the understanding of this there is a lack of data as you already have been uh, discussing the competence in this uh, you know, it's we, we all the time we have to to really be uh, discuss uh, to, uh, to inform and to educate because there can't be in skanska for example i mean if we five people doing the carbon calculations in in a central position i mean we are not the ones making decisions out in the projects it really has to be done in the projects and they have to do the change and that's our strategy actually um, and the comparisons how do we do it in a, so, so that it's going to be um, fair i think because the more you know about the project i think that's really important the more you know the more information the more you know about the project the higher your co2 emissions will be and i think that's something you showed as well if you include everything in the building you will have a higher uh, uh, co2 emission of course if you know if you have all the details uh, i mean some some uh, some of us are calculate, calculating 10 materials another one is calculating 1000 materials okay of course this is not comparable and the common needs that i th i see i think uh, this harmonization is a, i think it's a great initiative because there are so many things even if we have uh, standards we really have to interpret the standards and we have to be be transparent how we actually interpret the standards and i think it's really important that we have a common voice to the eu uh, all the eu suggestions and legislations that, that are coming because for us we're using epds for example uh, are we going to use something else then i mean there are a lot of work that has is wasted i think so i think we should try to to raise the quality of the, the epds instead but here it's great if we can discuss it and because there's something we all have to to be part of uh, the generic data that you've spoken about 
to actually define what is the generic data, what is it representing, and what's the quality of the generic data. I think for us, it's really important that we don't use EPDs if we don't have chosen what supplier we're actually buying from. Because here, uh, companies are doing, they, they use the EPD data because they have a better data, lower carbon, but they don't buy from it. And what's the, what's the point of the EPDs? I really think that EPDs should be for when you've decided that this is what we actually used, uh, this is the, 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 the one we, the supplier that we actually buy from. Otherwise, this will just be a number that is going around and the, the, the companies doing great EBDs, they, it looks like they have a great market share. But if you look at what actually been bought, it might, might not be the same. So I think we should have quality of the generic data that we can use until we can use the EPDs. That, that's something we use when we actually made our choice and actually buy it. Uh, the common interpretation of the standards, I said, the data and also all, uh, how to actually work with uh, module B and C. I think here we lack common scenarios. How do we actually do refurbishment, replacement? Uh, I mean, we don't, in a, in a real building, you don't replace one uh, building part at a time. It doesn't matter if one part has uh, 10 years, the other one has 20. If you, you mean you do a refurbishment and you do a replacement, but you do it uh, gathered as you, whatever as I don't know how to express it in, in English, but uh, the, the, I, I need, I really think we should support the initiatives about dig digitalization and the transparency of reference buildings here, because when you start communicating the reference buildings and the numbers here to, to for us, because uh, when we have to, we have, to, it has to be very, very transparent. Otherwise, it's really hard for us to explain why we are higher, lower, you know, because uh, common people, they don't understand that there's a, so many things that actually um, affects the reference value. So yeah, clear communication here. Uh, about the, uh, the, I said the, the quality of also the specific data, the EPDs, here is really, really important to us that it's at, that we can know that it's comparable because if I want to buy a product based on the, the, the EPD and the, the environmental uh, impacts, we, I really have to know that this is uh, comparable. And right now, we don't have all that information. We really need to know, is it a is this EPD, this specific data, is it for a single product? Is it for a factory? Is it for the whole company? Is it for the, the whole business? This, there are so many things that are uh, affecting the values of the EPDs. And I think this leads to misunderstandings. And also I thought, don't think uh, the competition won't be uh, fair. So the Q metadata, which I think you might have heard of, it's a product from IBL. It's been uh, developed within a strategic program in Sweden. This is a way to, to give information about what is the spe specific, specific data actually, wh what is it covering? What's the, what does it represent? And that's something I think in, in Sweden that we realized that we are, we have to have more information than just the EPD value. And uh, finally, I think uh, uh, in Skanska, using the LCA and the carbon calculation, and, and when we pointed out what data we actually need, this has been a driving force also to, to be able to handle other type of data, because when you work in a digital process, you know the data belonging to environmental data and other data, doesn't matter what data you can, if you have it in the process, you can add more data. And this is something uh, that is really, really important to make us, to optimize, optimize our processes. So um, in Skanska, this is some other people in Skanska are using environmental issues and climate and, uh, and to actually drive other processes. And I think that's just great. And uh, in Skanska, we're also trying to to say that, to, to connect this to circul circularity, which I think all of you already do, but um, to, to make the LCAs and, and the importance of knowing what we actually used 
not what we plan to use, but what we actually used, will be very valuable to us uh, in the future because that will be the re resources that we use as building uh, materials in our next project. Uh, and I think uh, oh, that's all I had to say. I'm sorry for the. I, I didn't make this work really. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think that's not a problem. Uh, that's what happens when we go when we all have to go digital. <laughs> yeah, but I, I had one version of my presentation on my screen and another one for you. So okay. <laughs> that was a bit uh, a little bit confusing, confusing I, I think, for me, especially when it, I have to talk English in Swedish. I, I think that wouldn't be a problem, but in English, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Uh, now, uh, the, for the last part, uh, I was to do a quick summary, but uh, I actually think we will uh, skip that part. Uh, and I just want to say that uh, the working group and the dialogue forum will hopefully be continued. And uh, we will continue working uh, towards the targets that Christina uh, presented in the beginning uh, of, uh, of the webinar. And if you're interested in, in joining the dialogue forum, please uh, do not hesitate to contact me uh, and I will make sure uh, that you will be a part of that forum. Um, but one important uh, next step that we uh, actually have to talk about before we go to uh, questions and discussion uh, is uh, the next uh, Nordic Climate Forum. And I will leave this, uh, the scene for Anders. Um, you can unmute yourself and share your presentation if you want to. Thank you, Maria. Um, while I make this work, I want to share some happy news with you all. Uh, since night of this morning, we have gone live with our voluntary sustainability class. So you will be able to see that on that particular screen. But today, um, I can send in a link in the comment section if you're interested. Unfortunately, it's in Danish, but you can all read Danish, right? <laughs> Otherwise, I will, yeah, me for help. Great. So, um, we will, um, the Danish Transport Construction and Housing Authority will be hosting this year's Nordic Climate Forum for Construction on the 27th of August. And Anders, that's why I will give you, Anders, sorry. I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but uh, no I don't hear you. Uh, I, I hear some of what you're saying, but not everything. <laughs> Oh, that's Can unfortunate. You something uh, uh, with your sound, perhaps? I can try to move closer. Is this better? Yes, I think so. <laughs> that's better? Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Um, as I was saying, um, I will give this presentation because I really want to put on that. Um, yeah. And as you notice here, we have space channels like the Corona, and that's why we have chosen to have the forum digitally. And that, of course, both poses some uh, problems and some opportunities. One of the opportunities is that we are no longer limited by the, the capacity of our conference room. So for now, at least, the limits, uh, there's no limit on participation. Um, and of course, it's also easier and better for the environment if we don't have to travel that far to participate. Um, and we just have to state that at the conference drink for another time then. A uh, challenge with the webinar is, of course, that it's rather tiring to sit in front of a computer from 10 to 3. And I could sometimes uh, post some technical troubles with that sound and video. But we have done forces with a company called Mindset for IT that will help, help us uh, host the forum. And that's, we will hope that uh, they'll help keep the technical trouble at a minimum. And we have also tried to cut the screen time to approximately four hours, which I think is durable. So if you take a look at the program, um, which is what I would like your comments on, the overall idea about the program is to give a status on what has happened in the area and for the presentation and roundtable discussions to reflect the work that has been carried out over the last year. And lastly, to have the opportunity to give some more concrete uh, inputs for the future work of the Nordic Communication. We have uh, chosen to divide the day into, so to speak, two sessions, one before lunch and one after lunch. Uh, the first one with a series of presentation and the second one after lunch. 
discussion was possible to do feedback on the text. And it's all sprinkled and videos uh, from different speakers. Um, we'll start the presentation with some stages and current issues in the property industry and academia. And this is one of the areas that I really would like your suggestions on it. Um, the idea is that they should come with a, a presentation on what they have been doing since the last forum and also highlight maybe current issues or areas where they think uh, we should put in an eff extra efforts. So I'd like for you to give some inputs on who you think would be good to represent the industry and the academia. And after this, this will be followed by uh, a presentation about the possible Nordic generic product database and, a product, and the projects about reference buildings. So a little like today, actually. After lunch, we will start with a presentation on how the digital roundtables are going to work. And like last year, for those of you who participated, the round discussion will start out with like with the same uh, frame as last time with a small presentation, after which you will be divided into smaller groups. And this will be all made very easy digitally, so you'll just have to lean back and it will actually do it for you. It will be automatically going into the groups and going back out to the main presentation as well. So it should work. The roundtable discussions are an opportunity to get into the in-depth discussions about the two subjects that were presented earlier, the Nordic generic project base and projects on reference building. And it's also an opportunity for you to give inputs to the subjects. Um, a suggestion could be that the two roundtable discussions are hosted by someone from the industry, at least the first 10 minutes uh, of presentation. And that's why I would like your inputs on who you think could would be good to, to have this startup presentation. Um, beside that, I would also like your inputs on possible questions to discuss at the roundtable discussions. And that could be questions like which topics are important for you to get a clarification on or what issues is important to address. Before and after the roundtable discussion, we also hopefully have some insight from high level representatives from both the EU and from the World Green Building Park. Council, and they are here, of course, because we want some valuable insights. But it also um, the idea about them is that they are pre-recorded. So if you need an extra break, you will have the opportunity to go out here, and then you can watch the videos later on. Great. So what I would like to ask of you is to send in your suggestions on speakers to give a status and highlight current issues and speakers to introduce the roundtable discussions and questions to discuss at the roundtable discussions. And you can send it into the email you see here, ANBR, and then I have no idea how to pronounce that name in English, tbst.dk. And if you could please submit your proposal no later than the June 3rd, because we need to start inviting speakers and start drafting the material. Thank you, that was all. Thank you, Anders. And, and with that, uh, we have listened to all the presentations and uh, we have uh, a few more minutes for, for questions. And